Lord, we welcome you to our services. Pray the Lord to bless us in our time of worship this morning. Take your Bible with me and turn back to Romans chapter 7. And I want to preach a third message. Seems kind of weird being that I had one of those uh, that we was from a year ago. <laughs> this is the third message. This would be the Believer's Warfare Part 3. Yeah, I, I guess it, it comes with age. You know, when you've been doing what I've been doing now for almost 35 years in preaching the gospel, I, I get to encounter a lot of a lot of and varied individuals in this world. Get a lot of emails that I wouldn't want anybody to read. And get some that are complimentary and some that are not complimentary. Receive phone calls and have had discussions online with a great number of people. But having dealt with all these religious individuals through the years, I'm quite certain that the vast majority of them, they cannot and they will not submit to the reality of the justified saints' lifelong warfare and sadly, in many instances, their failure when it comes to their ongoing warfare with sin in their own persons. You know, they, they, these people that I encounter, they, they, they absolutely bristle at the idea that a believer can sin willfully. You know, we preached that message here not too long ago if we sin willfully. But they just bristle at the idea. They, they think, oh, you can't make a statement like that that believers sin willfully. Well, listen, if you ain't figured out by now that every sin you commit is a willful sin, shame on you. You have not been drugged, kicking and screaming into any sin you've ever committed. You did it willfully. I don't care how you cut it. And they even use verses like the one that we preached on in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, 27, to defend their position that a believer cannot sin willfully. They make statements like this. Well, believers might sin, but they don't sin willfully. Or they'll say believers can sin, but they won't practice sin. Well, tell me the difference. If you do it once, do it twice, isn't it still practicing according to the Scripture? You break the law in one point, you're a transgressor. Not you've transgressed. That's what the law says. You break the law in one point, you're found a transgressor. No way back. That's the thing that religious people do not understand and they cannot understand. The law, when broken, is broke. Period. It's not by continual actions that you break it worse. You break it once, the law requires your death. Eternally. It brings eternal condemnation for the least sin in the best of men. Just one. And yet we act like somehow, some way, we can do something enough, enabled by God the Holy Spirit, to rectify the, the sin that we committed in the past. So they'll use verses like that. For if we sin willfully after that, we receive the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. In other words, if you, whatever that, and that's the thing, you can't ever pin them down on which one's the willful one. I, I think most of the time when people start talking about willful sin, because I know I used to do it when I was a false preacher, and I talked about Hebrews 10, I would always preach it in this context, verse 23, 24, before verses 25 and 26. I think I'm right. It might be, might be the other way, but I think it's 24 and 25. It has to do with this, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And that would be the sin I'd nail everybody on. If you can avoid church, <laughs> if you don't come to church every single solitary time the doors are open, there remaineth no more sacrifice. Isn't that ridiculous how we come up with stuff like that? I tell you what, the mind is depraved. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. But the only thing you got, you whatever you commit a willful sin, a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation will sh which shall devour the adversaries. In other words, by whatever sinful act you com commit, you have become the adversary of God. And he's become your adversary. Could you envision God Almighty being your adversary? 
Go back and look at the way he deals with his adversaries. Go back and look at how he did with Korah. Korah's only issue was he questioned Aaron's right to be the priest. And God said, I'm going to show you a new deal. I opened the ground up, and I'm going to swallow everybody that's in following this dude. They're going into the ground, and God closed it up, and it was like they never existed. They, those folks I'm talking about, they're kind of like those that Paul encountered in his day which we mentioned this last week, that accused him of teaching, let us do evil, or let us do, yeah, let us do evil that, that good may come. And I, see, that's the thing. That's the, that's the only thing the natural mind can hear and rationalize when the message of full, free, eternal salvation through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ with absolutely no condition on the sinner is boldly and dogmatically declared in their hearing. That's all they can hear. I know I've said this before, but I'll say it again. If you are lost this morning, when you hear me say there are no conditions on the sinner, you are like, you are like that that you, you hear like what in the Charlie Brown Thanksgiving special where the woman's up at the blackboard and she talks and all you hear is want, 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 want. When you hear that, a full, free, eternal salvation with no conditions in any way, to any degree, at any time, on the center, all the conditions on Christ, you think, let us do evil. That's what he's saying. He's saying we can do whatever we want to do. Those of you that know me, is that what I'm saying? Those of you that heard me preach for 35 years, you ever heard me say, it don't matter how you live? Matter of fact, have you ever heard me say, be worse so you can get more grace? Could you envision somebody standing up there and saying something like that? Here's the thing. Paul wasn't concerned about what goats would do with the sheep's food. And I'm not concerned either. And you shouldn't be concerned. I can't help it if a goat wrestles the word of God to their own destruction. And uses it. If, man, if some man or woman hears what I say, and in their unregenerate mind, they, they take it to mean... I'm going to do more evil so I can do more good. Does it change the gospel? Does it make the gospel to be the one that's in error? Where's the error at? You see that? Our concern, I, I'm not concerned about what goats think. I'm concerned about one thing. I'm concerned about the glory of God. How about you? And by being concerned about the glory of God, this is what I mean, that I'm concerned about the only hope and cause of salvation. The only ground upon which God can be revealed in his every attribute of his holy character is both a just God and a Savior. And, and as we'll see throughout this entire chapter, Paul brings forth argument after argument to set forth the complete freedom from the law for all those who are vitally united to Christ by divine election, chosen by God the Father in everlasting covenant of grace, redeemed and justified by Christ's work of redemption at Calvary, those sinners regenerated, converted in time by God the Holy Spirit under the preaching of the gospel. Paul said, wherefore, my brethren, this is where we ended up last week, wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Why, Paul? That you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. Paul's already told us why he was raised from the dead. Why was he raised from the dead? According to Romans chapter 4, he was raised again for our justification. We're married to him who justified us, that we should, and this is where we left off last week, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Like I heard Bill Parker state from this pulpit many, many, many years ago. Might not even, probably wasn't this pulpit, it's probably back out yonder. And do bought the whole little white pulpit you built me, Bob. 
I remember when he stated this. I, 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 I've hung on to this my whole life. The justified sinner has for his or her starting place what the self-righteous religionist has for his or her goal. What does that mean? The justified sinner starts right there. Right where? They're justified. That's our, that's our present position. We're justified. And that doesn't mean I'm just as if I'd never sinned. I, you still sin. What does justified mean? God has, God has dealt with our sins perfectly and completely and eternally in the person of his son based on Christ's righteousness alone. But the self-righteous, moral, religious, legal person, they're trying to attain a righteousness Trusting in what they do as opposed to what the Lord Jesus Christ did for his people, for his bride. And see, the thing is, the doctrine that Paul's setting forth here in Romans 7, it's not some new doctrine. It's not something that he came up with that was different than when he first believed the gospel. It's the same exact message that he preached in Acts chapter 13. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. What are you saying, preacher? This is what I'm saying. Before you and I could ever bring forth fruit unto God, before you and I could ever bring forth acceptable obedience unto God, a sinner has to be made righteous. And not just made the righteousness of man. What have they got to be made? They've got to be made the righteousness of God. Listen to this. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by the which he obtained witness, or God testified that, listen to this, he was righteous. He didn't get made righteous because he brought the sacrifice. The sacrifice testified of what he already was. Big deal of difference. People say, I don't know, you just... It's semantics. I remember when somebody first time I had to get the dictionary up and look at what the what the heck they mean. Now you just talk about semantics. That's down at Alexandria. A lady told me that. That's just semantics. I'm like, no. What do you mean? <laughs> Dumb old country boy. That's what I chalked that one up to. It's not just semantics. It's not just arguing about words. If your person's not accepted, everything you do is unacceptable. You hear? John even stated it like this, not as Cain who was of that wicked one. Well, hold on now, wait. How could we determine Cain was of that wicked one? Well, he was an immoral profligate, what he was, right? No. You go back and read the testimony in Genesis chapter 4. What did he do? Then, the course of time, he went to worship God. And he brought what? The fruit of his hands to, to give a sacrifice to God. What is that? What was he doing? He was practicing religion. He wasn't out in, in, in a house of prostitution. <laughs> He wasn't smoking a joint. He wasn't drunk. He was down there seeking to worship God. But he said he was of that wicked one and slew his brother. Why? Wherefore did he, why did he kill Abel? Because his own works were evil. He knew it. Because he had been taught all his life by his mom and his daddy what he had been taught. How do you approach God? I guarantee you, I bet you Abel, Abel and Adam and Eve had a, a clear idea of that, didn't they? They saw it firsthand. The only way back is what? Blood. Somebody's got to die. And I guarantee you, when them boys got big enough for them to know, I bet you Adam and Eve, and Adam more than Eve, because he was our representative man and had been, he was the one that brought this mess on us. I guarantee you told him, boy, the only ra- boys, 
the only way we can be free is through blood. You think he told them that? Do you tell your kids? Don't, don't guarantee they're going to believe it, but whose responsibility is to tell them? We'll bring them down there to the church on Sunday morning. Brother Richard will tell them, no, yours. I do, I'll, I'll tell them, but you better be telling them too. And you better show them by your actions and activities what's the most valuable thing to you. And I'm going to tell you what, if, if, if it's not valuable to you, I, I know God's sovereign. I, I get tired of people saying, well, you just contradict the sovereignty of God. No, I tell i got a mind. I know God's sovereign, but I know God uses means, and the means he uses is the gospel. We need to, we need to tell our kill, children about Christ. His right, his it works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Why? Because God had accepted Abel's person. Abel was a just man when he came. He wasn't coming to get justified. He came as one who was justified. Now keep in mind that Paul's continuing to expound that example that he gave us in the first four verses of chapter 7. That, that just like the wife who's free from the law of her husband through his death, she's free to marry another person with no consequences. The believer is just as free and just as enabled to serve their true husband, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Because here's the thing. When we were married to the law, we couldn't serve him. Because ever, all of our service, what was it based on? Our legal obedience. Or our mercenary obedience. Now in start verses 5 and 6 that we're going to look at this morning, Paul shows the contrast between two distinct states. And I've always found that amazing about the Word of God. From the very beginning, from those first two boys, Cain and Abel, there's always been two states. There's Cain and there's Abel. There's Jacob and there's Esau. There's the elect, there's the non-elect. There's the sheep, there's the goat. There's the wheat, there's the tare. And there's nothing in between. There's no middle ground. In these two distinct states, he states them very clearly. You're either in the spirit or you're in the flesh. And I'm going to tell you, get this right. Once in the spirit, you don't ever go back in the flesh. You hear that? You don't, don't vacillate between the two. Look at the first part of I, verse 5. For when we were in the flesh. And that's, a, that, 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 that's in the past tense. It's, a, it's an event that has already occurred. So we were. We were in the flesh. And I wrote this in my notes. It sounds like something pretty elementary but it's just true I, I'm, I'm pretty certain those to whom Paul wrote this letter and even believers who read this letter today we're still in the flesh aren't we if we talk about flesh as men consider flesh we're living in a body there's no doubt about it but that wasn't what the Holy Spirit meant by moving the Apostle Paul to write these words for if, when we were in the flesh because he states it conclusively so whatever it means to be in the flesh, Paul is stating beyond a shadow of a doubt that a justified saint, listen to me, a justified sinner, a redeemed sinner, a believing sinner, one vitally united to the Lord Jesus Christ by true God-given faith, they are no longer in the flesh. Period. He uses the same language in Romans 8, verses 8 and 9. Listen to this. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You hear that? you in the flesh, can't please God. Well, it kind of comes back to that thing. All you got to do is say the sinner's prayer. you in the flesh. You can't please God. Nothing you do. But, listen to this, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. How do we know if you're in the Spirit? If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you now listen to this 
Now, if any man have not the Spirit of God, this is for those people who believe in the second blessing. You know, they think you get saved and then later on you get the Holy Spirit. Mm-mm-mm. This is what he says. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, you ain't waiting on no second blessing. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Folks, to be in the flesh, you know what it is? It's to be in an unregenerated state. It's to be dead in trespasses and sin. It's to be unable and incapable of being able to please God by any actions or activities, no matter how sincere or noble or moral all those efforts might be. And if we understand what it means to be in the flesh... It makes what Paul's stating here a whole lot more easy to understand. Because notice what he says. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Now let me try to make this as clear as I can to you. When we were in the flesh, this is what Paul's saying. When we were in the flesh, that is to say when we were lost, when we were unregenerate, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Now, I know a lot of people, they they read that and they say, hold on now, the cause of sin in man is the law. That ain't what Paul's saying. That's not the charge he's making. He's not charging the law, God's holy law, as the source or cause of our former corruption. Matter of fact, Paul states later in this same chapter, wherefore the law, without any regard to what you do with it, the law is holy, it's just, it's perfect, and it's good. Right? Can we agree on that? The problem's not with the law. What's the problem? The problem's with the depraved, sinful nature in which a believer previously had walked when they were in the flesh. We spent all our lives, I guarantee at some point in time you've heard this, laws are made to be broken. I love my boys to death. Matthew was always the good one. (laughs) But that Jeremy, if you told him, and he's just like Daddy, because when Alvin Warmack told me no, to me, you know what it meant? It meant go. It means yeah. Go ahead and do it. And so when dad, whatever daddy told me not to do, that was exactly, I did the exact opposite. And that, that, that's what the, the reality is. The problem's not with the law. But it's with the one on whom the law makes its righteous demands. In that former state, when we were in the flesh... The law, which is holy and just and perfect and good, it worked in our depraved faculties. What what we were by nature, that is to say our mind, our will, and our understanding. And because we saw the law, what did we do? We brought forth the only thing we could bring forth by nature. What? Fruit unto death. Remember who's writing this? Who's writing it? The Apostle Paul. When he was Saul of Tarsus, what do you think his fruit unto death was? Huh? I, I, let me give you a clue. It isn't what the world would consider immorality and ungodliness. He didn't have that issue. What was his fruit unto death? Trying to establish a righteousness. That's what, that's what it was. You don't believe that, you don't believe the book. Go read what he said about himself in Philippians chapter 3. Concerning the righteousness required by the law, what was I? Blameless. So his fruit unto death wasn't out in what the world says is sin. It was in what the scriptures say is sin. Seeking to establish a righteousness. And when you think about it, when Paul was in the flesh as Saul of Tarsus... Everything he did by way of obedience was more sinful and more vile and more fruit unto death than any of the sins and immorality he sought to avoid and stamp out. 
Our Lord said this. He said to them, you are they which justify yourselves before men. Who's included in that number? Saul of Tarsus. The Pharisees. He was speaking to the Pharisees. But God knows your heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination unto God. Everything Saul of Tarsus did, what name did he do it in? He did it in the name of Jehovah God. And he did it in defense of what? The Mosaic Law. And the laws of men. The production of what he now calls fruit unto death. Folks, it can't be blamed on God's holy law. It cannot be. The blame has to be laid where? At the feet of the corrupt, sinful nature that is in man. I love what John Gill wrote when he wrote concerning these words. It's a little lengthy passage, but I... It, it, it made so much sense when we think about the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. He said this, The true sense of Paul's word is that these motions of sin are irritated, provoked, and increased through the law's prohibition of those very sins, which is not to be charged as a fault of God's law, but to be imputed to the depravity and corruption of man who is like one who is burning up with fever, very desirous to drink, who the more it is forbidden, the more he is eager to drink of it. Or he's like a mighty torrent of water which rises and rages and flows and overflows, the more any methods are taken to stop the current. But this is the one I like. Or like a filthy dung hill, which when the sun strikes powerfully on it, if you're a farmer and Round cows, you know that. <laughs> when the sun shines powerfully on it, exhales and draws out the dung pile's filthy stench, which nauseous smell is not to be imputed to the pure rays of the sun, but where? But to the filthiness of the dung hill. These motions of sin are said to work in our members, that is to say in the members of our bodies, which these sinful affections of the soul make use of, of it to put them into action. And so they bring forth fruit, very evil fruit indeed. For nothing else can be expected from an evil tree as the corrupt nature of man is. Christ said an evil tree cannot produce good fruit. What you got is, what's got to happen? The tree's got to be made good. Paul told what, it, what Paul's telling these Roman believers and what he's telling you and me who get to read this blessed letter is this. That's our former state. That's where we were. But notice our contrast in state. But now we are delivered from the law. That being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. I think one of the greatest blessings that you and I as justified saints enjoy is this. We are delivered from the law. Delivered from the law. And here's the thing. Words are so important. The, the word Paul used, the Greek words translated by the English phrase, we are delivered, it's the same word he used back up in verse 2. Translated, she is loosed. How's she loosed? Through the death of her husband. She's loosed from the law of the husband. And in both instances, they mean the same thing. Translated different English word means the same thing. What does it mean? Cause to cease, put to an end, do away with, annul, abolish, render idle. I like this, unemployed, inactive, inoperative. With that in mind, listen to this. For the woman which hath an husband is bound to the law of her husband so long as she liveth, he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she's loosed. It's annulled. It's abolished. It's inactive. It can bring forth no demands. She's loose from the law of the husband. 
How can a sinner by birth, this is the question that I use, how can a sinner by birth, by nature, by practice, and by choice be delivered from the law in its righteous demand? Do you know? Should you know? I think that would be the question we need to ask. You're dead gum right. You better know. Because I tell you what, all those taught of God know. I know that. How are we set free? Paul tells us. Having abolished. There's the same word. Translated the third English phrase. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man making peace. And that, listen to this, that how, do you, how do we do this? How can a sinner born of a woman be made clean? Here it is. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body on the cross. How are you going to do that, Lord? He slew the enmity. Thereby. What does that mean to me? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the law is my substitute, my surety. He suffered in his person my guilt, my condemnation, my penalty. In the words of my dear brother Bill Parker, I've heard him say so many times, he drank the cup of trembling, drank the cup of damnation dry, and he did not leave one drop in it for me to turn up. It's an empty cup. And yet we keep reaching back over and getting it, don't we? He set us free. And I'm going to tell you what, he that's dead is freed from sin. Paul said, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law ever again. You're under grace. Tell me, I, I, Tell me, the law is holy, just, perfect, and good. I love the law of God. And the inward man, I love it to death. I'm grateful for it. But you can't get life by it. Not by your obedience to it. Does that mean we're free to live like we want? You know, that we can live a life of immorality and ungodliness? Is that what we're saying? Not at all. Not at all. Because look at the next verse. That being dead wherein you were held. Because we were held. That we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. In other words, Paul tells us when we were dead in trespasses and sin, we, we were alienated and enemies in our minds by wicked works, when you and I, we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and listen to this language, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. doesn't say we were children of wrath, but by nature we were just like them. We were under the rule of our first husband, the law. And we could not serve God acceptably. Remember John's word concerning Cain. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brothers were righteous. I don't know about you, they didn't teach me that in vacation Bible school. And they didn't teach me that in Sunday school. They just told me Cain was bad and Abel was good. And that's kind of the way they worked the story out. Folks, these, these boys, look at them character and conduct wise, there was no difference. And see, they put those, they put those images in our mind. You, you, we, we, when you think about Esau, I mean, now that you're justified a saint, I know we, we look at these things differently, but if, we, if we're honest, when we consider the, the idea of Jacob and Esau, don't we think of Esau as a bad dude? I mean, just some kind of evil guy? Because that's the way our mind thinks. Because look, by nature, we can't, we can't determine and we can't judge between good and evil. We call that which is evil good, and we call that which is good evil. But see, here's the glorious freedom every justified saint enjoys, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of letter. That word translated should serve in the original, you know what it means? It means a slave or a bondman. Or the best translation of it is this, 
a man of servile condition. But being from the South, and really now and today being raised the way they're raised and taught across the country, when we think of slavery, we think of bad things, don't we? Because of the connotation in our minds from all the history that's been written about how bad. And slavery was bad. Don't, don't think that I'm condoning slavery. But, folks, the word that he uses here is not the same idea we have about the slavish dread, drudgery and, and mean-spirited nature in which other men and women have treated other men and women throughout time. That's not what he's talking about. There have been slaves forever. This word that uses here, the Strong's Greek Concordance says this word figuratively, and listen to this, it figuratively, boy, that's a hard word to say, means one who gives himself up to another's will. You hear that? That's what this word means, that we should serve. It means that we should give ourselves up to another's will. Here's the same word used in reference to our Lord Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form, here it is, of a servant. He took upon himself what? Giving himself up to another's will. Folks, Christ wasn't forced to offer himself up. But out of love to his Father and his great love wherewith he loved us, those given to him by the Father, he willingly submitted himself to whose will? The Father's. I always think of him in the garden. Lord, if it, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. In other words, if there's any other way, let it pass. Nevertheless, not my will. But thy will be done. Christ said of himself, For I came down from heaven. You tell me, talk about submission, servitude, a bondman, one who had given himself up to another's will. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me to do the work. And folks, as God's redeemed the object of his love, we ourselves are made willing bond slaves, serving him in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Now this newness of spirit, it's not in us by nature. But it's that new principle imparted to you and me, instilled in us, I don't like that word imparted, instilled in us by God the Holy Spirit in regeneration and conversion when he translates us out of the kingdom of darkness and translates us into the kingdom of his dear son, enabling him us to serve God acceptably, not out of slavish dread, and not out of mercenary promise or reward, but here's a word I had to look up the definition, but out of filial love. You know what filial means? Anybody? It means, it means the devotion of a child, a childlike love, the love of a parent. I've always said this. I always wanted my boys, Pam and I both, we wanted our boys to obey us, not because they were scared of us, but because they loved us. Because see, the thing is, I, I, I learned this a long time ago, even when I was a lost person. If it's not love that motivates a child to be obedient when the threat goes away, you ever seen kids, been good kids all their life, you go away to college, what happens to them? They get out from underneath. I had one old boy, I grew up with school, that sucker never drank, never smoked, never did anything. He never cussed. I never heard that boy say one cuss word all the way through school. We was just breaking them off like we're using them in verbs and adverbs and nouns and making sentences out of them. He never would and would look at us like, oh, yeah. Was home at 10.30 and 11 o'clock. He's a senior in high school. Went home at 11 o'clock on, on the night we graduated. Went away to Natchitoches, which was only 30 miles away. It wasn't like he went 500 miles away. That sucker went absolutely stark raving mad. Went to smoking dope. And getting drunk. I, next time I saw him, I was like, this can't be the same person. <laughs> but that's the thing. You take the rule away and there's no love motivating. What happened? You take the rule off. They go start raving mad. But there's one last thing. Look at that last statement. 
not in oldness of the letter. That's how every one of us by nature sought to serve God. Oldness of the letter. This serving in oldness of the letter respects service to the law based on the law's light and its authority and its terror. Do this and live. Don't do this and die. Here's its terror. Good people go to heaven. Bad people go to hell. It's to seek life and justification. The oldness of the letter is to seek life and justification by obedience to it without the spirit of God's grace and influence. Robert Haldane wrote this. Much, and we'll quit with this this morning, much outward conformity to the law may in this way be attained from the pride of self-righteousness without any principle better than that of a slavish Selfish, mercenary, carnal disposition influenced only by a fear of punishment and a hope of reward. That's why most people in church today, they're worried about punishment or they're looking for a star in their crown. Serving then in the oldness of the letter is serving in a cold, constrained, and wholly external manner, much like the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Such service is essentially defective, proceeding from a carnal, unrenewed heart, destitute of true holiness found only in Christ. In this way, Paul described himself in Philippians 3, as having formerly served when he had confidence in the flesh, as he there designates such outward service. Service, and this is so important to me, serving in newness of spirit and in oldness of the letter are here contrasted not only as different, but totally incompatible one with another. If our service is out of oldness of the letter, out of servile fear or promise of reward, we prove ourselves at that particular time to be void of God's sovereign grace and mercy, that grace and mercy that can only be revealed to the elect sinner by God the Holy Spirit through the preaching of the gospel. And we'll stop right there and we'll come come back next week, Lord willing, and we'll pick up in verse 7. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed.